Hey there y'all, PDT here, waiting on Periscope to come up on this Mother's Day. Hold on, I got another, there we go, Periscope. Let me get this going. Alright, <clears throat> got that going. Alright, got a, a Mother's Day message uh, that I got from the Lord, so let's jump right in. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for this Mother's Day. Thank you for access to your presence by faith. Thank you for all that you've called us to do and be. Uh, and thank you for seeing another wonderful day of life. So I surrender to you, God. I should have used my mind, my, my heart, my lips, uh, my brain, everything. I surrender to you, God, to be used for your glory, to release whatever word you want me to release. And I thank you for it, and I believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, today is Mother's Day, so we're going to look at uh, some very familiar scriptures that talk about uh, our subject today is godly mothers. So we're going to look at some very familiar scriptures that talk about that very thing. But let me tell you why we're looking at these scriptures. We're looking at these scriptures because God wants his daughters to have his parameters. What do I mean by that? I mean, anybody can get straight A's when you self-grade. <laughs> but what God wants us to do is not measure ourselves by our own thoughts and not measure ourselves by man's standards and not measure ourselves by other people, but rather to measure ourselves by the standards of his word. And uh, one thing my pastor talked about this morning was the godly mother anointed coming back into the kingdom of God. But what the Holy Spirit was showing me is, was that, what does that look like? And that's why we have the scriptures, so we can know God's thoughts, so we can know what, he, what he's thinking. Because some daughters of God might be out there thinking that they're being godly, and they're not, they might not be being godly at all. They may not be setting the example they think they are. But that impact, man, that impact is generational. Uh, just to give you a little bit of my story, it was my grandmother, my father's mother, my paternal grandmother, that she didn't specifically lead me to Christ, but she's the one that let me know that God was real. She took me on missions trips with her, me and my cousin, when she would go visit the sick and shut in. And she was a missionary in our church, and she would make us uh, do morning devotion before we ate. If I was over there on Saturday before she let us have them good home-cooked pancakes, she said we had to do morning scripture and prayer, and she wouldn't let us you know, like wash clothes on Sunday, and when I was sitting in her living room, I could feel the presence of God around her. I didn't know exactly what I was feeling, but I could feel him before I got to know him for myself. And she prayed for me even when I was a baby and did some deliverance on me, some stuff my cousin told me about that I didn't know about too much later in my life. So it was really my father's mother who stood in the gap for me, took me to church with her sometimes if I was getting a little sleepy when I was a little boy. She let me just lay down on her lap and um, taught me how to act in church and just had such an impact on my life. And I didn't have her, but for 15 years, she died when I was 15. And I miss her every day. But it was because of her I knew that Christ was real. It was because of her I first felt the presence of God in an atmosphere. Because of her, I was doing missions trip training as a child, I didn't even know it. It was all because of her. So I'm saying that to say that her legacy lives on in me and my family to this day. And she's been gone a very long time. And her legacy lives on. And so that's what I mean when I say, if God is calling for that spirit to come back in the body of Christ, if God is calling for his daughters to be reestablished as godly mothers and grandmothers, then we really, really, really need to know what that is. And that's why we have the scriptures. Okay? So it's that, with that in mind, let's dive into Titus chapter 2. We're going to read verses 3, 4, and 5. Titus is one of the Pauline epistles, one of the letters that Paul wrote to Titus in the New Testament. Okay? Titus uh, chapter 2, verses 3, 4, and 5. I'm going to read out of the Berean Study Bible. It says, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not slanderers or addicted to much wine, but teachers of good. That's verse 3. It says, Older women, so if you've got some years on you, it says that 
you're to be reverent in their behavior. Now, reverent means, the Greek word there means suitable to sacred character. That is so opposite of what we see in so many people now a day. They're irreverent. If you don't know what that means, that means they don't have any respect for anything. And they don't carry themselves with any type of class or dignity. Just loud and not self-controlled and, and no class at all and no respect. That's irreverent. Okay? Um, always trying to grab attention when it's not your turn. <laughs> when somebody else is doing something, but you're always trying to grab the attention, that's disrespectful. That's irreverent. God says that his daughters, his, his older women in the body, aren't supposed to be like that. They're supposed to be reverent and respectful of what's going on and have sacred character. And my grandmother had that. And then it says, not slanderers, oh Lord. Now that word slanderers there is uh, diabolus. It means a traducer or especially Satan. In other words... The spirit that always has something bad to say about you is the devil. It's Satan. Okay? Because part of what he does is slander. He's always finding something negative to say, or he'll just make up something and lie about the saints and accuse us before the throne of God. The Bible says that if you were to be a godly woman, you're not supposed to be like that. You're not supposed to be slandering people. You're not supposed to be walking around seeing the worst in people. You're not supposed to be spreading lies and trying to mess up their, their reputation. Uh, you know, God said, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Okay, that's the ninth commandment. So if you're a godly woman, you're supposed to be reverent and respectful, have sacred character, and you're not supposed to be walking around spreading lies and spreading negativity about people. Then it says, or addicted to much wine. Oh, Lord. Now, some folks, <laughs> you got their mamas and their grandmamas where they lit by 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Some of them women is 9.30 in the morning and they just a toe up. The, <laughs> the Bible says that if you are to be a woman of God and walk in this anointing, you're not supposed to be hooked on liquor. And you're definitely not supposed to be toe up at 9.30 in the morning. Because that's an example you're setting for your children and your grandchildren. And when you live like that, they're not going to hear what you have to say if they know that all you are into is wine and liquor and whatnot. They just will not hear you. Your kids and your grandkids won't take you seriously if you're a lush, if you're an alcoholic. And they know it and you know it and you're trying to act like it ain't true. So it says you're not supposed to be addicted to much wine. But then it says <clears throat> teachers of good, okay? Now that phrase there, teachers of good, means a teacher of which is noble or honorable and good or a teacher of the right. So in verse 3, it tells godly women two things they're not supposed to be and two things they are supposed to be. You're not supposed to be a slanderer and you're not supposed to be addicted to alcohol. You are supposed to be reverent and respectful in your behavior and you are supposed to be a teacher of that which is honorable. So you see, part of that godly mother anointing has to do with teaching. It has to do with letting the next generation know how to behave. See, that's in women from God, and that's a godly anointing. And that's what we need, and that's what we need godly mothers and grandmothers to do, is to teach the next generation how to behave, because my grandmother taught me how to behave, taught us how to be quiet in church, taught us how to be respectful of the pulpit, taught us how to be respectful of the house of God, taught us how to be respectful of communion, understanding that was symbolic of the body and the blood of Christ, and was something to be respectful of. It wasn't a joke. It wasn't a game when it's time to take communion. Okay? My grandmother taught us all those things. And she taught us not just by word, but by example. She did them herself. Because she was traveling and visiting the sick from as far back as I can remember. So she doesn't, wasn't just teaching with a word. She was showing us what a godly lifestyle was like. And I'm talking I'm seven, eight, nine years old watching this. Okay? So, those are some parameters, some standards so if you want to be a woman of God, a godly mother, then you've got to be respectful and you've got to be teaching that which is good. You can't be disrespectful, a slander, or addicted to wine. Okay? Now, let's move on to verse 4. Titus chapter 2 verse 4 says this, In this way they can train the young women to love their husbands and children. Okay? There's a lot in those verses. That word train means to make sober-minded, 
uh, admonish or, or self-control, to make of a sound mind, to discipline or correct. Now, what the Bible just told you is that you have to be taught how to be a wife and a mother. A lot of young women I know struggle with that because nobody ever taught them how because sometimes people think that being a parent is innate. Being a parent is not innate. Having sex and making babies is innate. Don't nobody have to teach you how to do that. But actually being a godly parent and a godly spouse, somebody got to teach you how to do that. Now, I don't want you to miss that. A lot of people are struggling right now in their marriages and in their situations because nobody ever taught you how to do what you're trying to do. Nobody ever taught you how to do what you're trying to do. So if you are a woman of God and you have some years on you, it says you're supposed to train the young women to love their husbands, okay? That phrase there is uh, be affectionate as a wife, uh, to love their husbands and children. And again, loving one's children. It, that word also means maternal. So again, uh, sometimes the idea is propagated that that comes natural to all females. That's not the truth. That is not the truth. It does not come natural to all females to know how to treat a husband. And it most definitely does not come natural to all females to know how to love and raise a child. So if you are a woman of God and you have been respectful of your husband and you have raised your family, you're supposed to turn around and the Bible says here, train the young women on how to do that because they're not going to innately and automatically know what that looks like or what that means. And that's why a lot of people are unhappy in their marriages. That's why a lot of people are unhappy in their situations. That's why a lot of people are frustrated because they're not getting the results they want. But the reason they are not getting the results they want is because they don't know how. They don't know how to talk to a man. They want him to listen, but they don't know how to. There's a way to talk to a man to get him to listen to you. Some women know how to do it. Some women don't. There's a way to approach your husband to get him to listen to you. Some women know how to do it. Some women don't. There's a way to shape and mold your children. And some women know how to do that and some women don't because you've got to prepare your children for a life away from you. Okay? If you live to be 100 years old, you have the smallest amount of time in your life as a child. That means that God and nature mean for you to be grown. <laughs> okay? So out of 100 years of living, you're going to spend your smallest amount of time as a child. That means that God does not mean for you to stay a child, okay? And some women get so used to mothering. I've met some women who don't have any identity. They're so used to being mom, they don't really have any identity outside of being mom, okay? But part of being taught how to be a mother is you've got to get your kids, you've got to wean them off the breast and get your kids ready to have life away from you because they're going to spend the majority of their years as an adult. They're not still supposed to be underneath your coattails, some women get that, some women don't. So an older woman's got to come along and teach you how and when to, when it's time for them to let your child go and let them transition into other stages, and when it's time for them to move out and move into their own house and move into their own situation. Because a whole lot of moms don't like to let go. But the Bible says that you got to leave and cleave. So when it's time for you to build your own family, you got to leave your parents and build your own nest. Okay? Let's move on to verse 5, Titus 2 and 5. Titus 2, 5 says, is a continuation of the thought in verse 4, to be self-controlled, pure, managers of their household, kind and subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God shall not be discredited. In some uh, versions, English Standard versions, it said that the word of God may not be reviled. In the King James Version, it says that the word of God be not blasphemed. There's a lot of standards in Titus 2.5. It says you have to be self-controlled, okay? And the opposite of self-control is wilding out. So if you're still wilding out, you are not acting like a woman of God. You have to be self-controlled. Then it says pure. What does it mean, pure? It means clean. It means modest. It means innocent. In other words, it means not promiscuous. You're not sleeping around. You're not laying with every man in town, Okay? But you've covered yourself up and you've, re you've reserved your sexuality for your husband. Okay? It's hard for people to take you seriously as a woman of God if you have promiscuity in your life. But when you're covered up and you make it clear that whatever sexuality you have is reserved for your husband, 
people take you seriously instantly. And if you have everything that God gave you just all out on display for anybody to see it that wants to see it, people are not going to take you seriously as a woman of God. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but it's still true. Okay, it says managers of their household. Okay, so uh, it also, another translation is keeper at home, a housekeeper, stay at home, domestically inclined. Uh, a lot of women are not stay-at-home moms today, but the Bible says that that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to manage your household. That's your responsibility to make sure things at home are running, running smoothly. And it takes a lot of effort to run a household smoothly. God, in fact, gave women three full-time jobs. Wife, mother, keeper at home. So if you're a wife and you're a mom and you keep the home, those are three full-time jobs right there. I know a lot of women work outside the home. I know a lot of women have part-time jobs or side gigs. But God already gave you three full-time jobs. You, you have a full plate if you want to be obedient to the Word of God. See, because there's an anointing and a grace and a huge blessing that you can't get any other way but to obey the Word of God. If you don't want to do what God says, you are free to run your life any kind of way you want to, but you will not get the blessing that God puts on those that are obedient. Because God is always looking for children that aren't arguing with him. God is always looking for children that aren't trying to tell the maker what to do. That aren't trying to tell him how all this goes. But are going to agree with him and do what he says do. And that's a huge blessing that you cannot get anywhere else uh, except in obedience to the word of God. So you're supposed to manage your own household. It says you're supposed to be kind and subject to the own husband's so that the word of God is not discredited or blasphemed. You know what that means? That means that when you're a so-called woman of God, but you are not like that, somebody is somewhere cursing God's name because of you. Somebody is somewhere saying, ain't nothing to that Jesus stuff, ain't nothing to that Christianity stuff. It ain't real because you are not like that. The Bible says very clear, that's a commandment to women, that if you are not self-controlled, pure, managers of your own household, kind, subject to your husband, Somebody somewhere is saying that the Bible ain't real because you are not exhibiting those qualities. Now, I personally know, I'm not going to call them names. I personally know some women that are so busy trying to be the first female Bishop T.D. Jakes. They treat their husbands like crap. I've seen it. I've seen it. You ain't going to never get blessed the way you want to get blessed if you're a married woman of God and you treat your husband like garbage. You're not uh, in submission to your husband. You're not in submission to the word of God. And you think God is going to lift you up in front of tens of millions of people and let you take that same foolishness and put it in front of everybody? <clears throat> he won't. And a whole lot of women in ministry, again, some women I personally know, are, are they keep wondering why they aren't any further than where they are. And the answer to that question is because they don't look like the scriptures say a godly woman is supposed to look. And because of the way they treat their husbands. God ain't going to never bless you the way you want him to bless you if you are disrespectful to that man. Because every time you sign your checks, you sign in that man's name. Oh, no, Prophet Taylor, you wrong. You see, because I hyphenate. So, so if you were born Shannon Green and you married a man named Michael Washington, you sign your, your name Shannon Green hyphen Washington. I stopped by to tell you that your maiden name is your father's name. That's two men. You sign your name, first name, father, husband. That's two men that you owe your identity to. So how are you going to say you're independent? And how are you going to be disrespectful of men? And every time you sign your checks, you sign in at least one man's name. So you can't be treating your dad or your husband any kind of way. And thinking that God's going to bless you, it will not happen. And that's what a whole lot of women don't understand. That's what their problem is. You can't talk to your husband any kind of way. You can't talk to your father any kind of way. That's not appropriate for a woman of God. So if you want to be a woman of God, it doesn't matter how you feel about the matter. What matters is what thus saith the Lord. And that's why we have the Bible. That's why we have the scriptures. And I've gone over Titus 3, 4, and 5 with you so that you can see these are God's standards. These are God's parameters. These are God's requirements to qualify you as a mother of God, a grandmother of God. If you listen to the Lord, God is going to give you a name that lasts beyond your lifetime. 
He's going to give you a name like he did Sarah, like he did Ruth, like he did Esther, like he did Deborah, like he did Mary, Jesus' mom. He's going to give you a name that outlives you. He's going to give you a name that people are going to be calling as blessed a hundred years after you're dead. He's going to establish your impact and your legacy and your family and use you to be nothing but a blessing the longest day you live if you choose to be a woman of God. And you know what's going to happen if you choose not to be a woman of God? God is going to take that crown off your head and give that anointing, that blessing to somebody else. He's going to do you like Jacob and Esau. He's going to take what might have been your birthright and put it on somebody else. And you're going to watch your sister get blessed. You're going to watch your sister inherit that mantle. You're going to watch your sister have all those blessings trace her down. You're going to watch your sister get the name. You're going to watch your sister get li lifted up. You're going to watch your sister get honored. Because you wouldn't obey God. You wouldn't become the woman of God that God has called you to be. So I want to repeat, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter what kind of personal standards you may have drawn up. We're talking about godly standards, and godly standards are found in the scripture. That's why I read for you Titus 3, 4, and 5, that you've got to have those kinds of standards in your life. Older women teaching the young women to love husbands and children. Be a self-controlled woman, a woman of class, respectful, honorable, pure, managing your own household, kind, not mean. Haven't you met, ever met some women in church and they just mean, they just mean like hungry dogs. Now, everybody has a bad, bad day. I'm not talking about somebody catching you off guard. I'm talking about as a way of being. Every time somebody come around you, you just biting and snapping. You just mean. God says, be kind. Subject to their own husband. You got to be in submission to your husband. You get benefits from that man every day. If danger comes in your door, you expect that man to put his body between you and danger. Every time you sign your checks, you sign in his name. And you think you don't owe him nothing for that? Yes, you do. And the Bible says that you need to be subject to your own husband. And if you're not doing all that, somebody is somewhere cursing God's name because of you. Somebody is somewhere speaking evilly of God and the scriptures and saying ain't nothing to Christianity because of you. That's the weight that's on being a godly mother and a godly woman. That's the kind of weight you carry. So I beseech you, therefore, daughters of God, yea, even I charge you, those of you that have heard or watching this program, to repent of anything that is not like God describes in the scripture. Because God is love and God loves you and his plan is higher than yours. And anything that God tells you to do in the scripture, it takes a cross for us to do it. We have to crucify ourselves to do it, but his plan is higher and you will become a better woman all around if you choose to be a godly woman, a godly wife, and a godly mother. Okay, so that's my charge to you this day as a prophet of God. That's my challenge to you this day as a man whose grandmother completely impacted his life. I don't know who I would be or where I'd be if it wasn't for my grandmother and my aunt that raised me. Two women that made sure I was in church every Sunday, that made sure I was filled with the Holy Ghost, that made sure that I knew the scriptures. I don't know who I'd be. I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for that influence. That's what I'm telling you. It's such a sacred call. It's a high call of God to be a woman of God. It's a high call of God to be a mother of God. It's a high call of God to be a grandmother of God. So don't despise it. Don't throw these scriptures away. Don't reject the teaching of these scriptures, but rather embrace. And anything in your life that's not like the scripture, repent. Humble yourself and go before God and ask the Lord. Say, Lord, if my life doesn't look how you want it to look, Lord, you please make me be the woman you want me to be. Make me be the mother and the grandmother you want me to be. And I repent of anything that's against your word. And watch what happens in your life. Okay, I'm going to give you a principle that's going to change your house in 24 hours. I told, When I was little, I heard a lot about waiting on God, but that scripture is misquoted. That scripture about waiting on God doesn't mean God promises you something last year and you've got to wait a year to get it. That's not what that means. But um, I asked God to show me some stuff that can change your life like that. And he did. One of the things I'm going to teach you now as a woman that will change your life in 24 hours. And here it is. There are three reasons that God put more words in your mouth than he put in the mouth of a man. I'm just going to teach you one today. Okay? 
One of the reasons that God put more words in your mouth than he did in the mouth of a man is because your first call as a wife and mother is intercession. One of the reasons you have that detailed brain from God that you pick up on details because you pick up on everything. You pick up on tones of voice. You pick up on smells. You pick up on facial expressions. You pick up on everything that happens in your household. Well, there's a reason that you're that way. You're that way is because you are supposed to lift up to God everything that's happening in that house. Everything that you see in that house, you're supposed to lift it up. And everything you want in your relationship with your husband and your relationship with your children, you're supposed to lift up to God. In exchange for your prayer, Jesus Christ will give you a list with three divisions on it. Three divisions. So you're supposed to be praying about everything you see and feel in that house. Not nagging your husband. That's nowhere in the Bible. But intercession, lifting it up to God, that's why you have more words in your mouth. As you learn how to make a list every day and write down everything you want and everything you see and everything you feel, lift it up to God. In exchange for that prayer, that prayer life, Christ will give you a list with three, three divisions on it. One division will be that which is spirit. In other words, the Lord will tell you, that stuff is from me. That stuff you're praying about, thinking and confessing, that's from me. Keep that up. That's my will. The, third, the second division will be personal stuff that you have to work out between your, you and your husband. That's just between the two of you. Like the Holy Ghost ain't going to give you no revelation on how to squeeze the toothpaste and <laughs> bathroom etiquette and kitchen etiquette. That's personal stuff you got to work out. And then the third part of your list, the Lord will show you that which is flesh. And the Lord will show you that if you keep doing that, you're going to wreck your marriage. If you keep doing that, you're going to lose your kids. Okay? So as a woman, you cannot assume you're right about everything. You have to humble yourself before God and lift up everything you think, think and feel and see in your house to Christ in intercession. And in return for doing that, Christ will give you a three-divided list. He will show you what you're doing that's right, that's walking in the Spirit, that He wants you to continue. He will show you what you're doing that's personal, that's just between you and your husband. You all got to work that out. And He will show you what you're doing that's flesh, that if you keep on doing it, it's going to bring death in your life. Did you know that? If you start doing that, I guarantee you in 24 hours, the whole atmosphere in your house is going to change. You'll see. It'll be the most amazing thing if you start using, as a woman, your power of intercession. Don't nag. Don't, don't just stop nagging. Stop complaining. Stop having bad stuff to say. Instead, use that micro detailed brain and use the greater number of words in your mouth to make an intercessory list. And don't hold back. Tell Jesus everything that you think and feel and see. And he will give you that list with those three divisions to tell you, keep doing this. This is personal. Y'all got to work that out and stop doing this. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed at what happens in your house when you stop nagging your husband and you start interceding for your husband. You'll be amazed at what happens in your home when you stop complaining about your home and start praying about your home, you'll be a minute. your whole mind is going to be blown. And it'll happen. What time is it? It's 3 o'clock on Sunday. By 3 o'clock on Monday, I guarantee you, your whole house will be different. It's the most amazing thing. So maybe later on, I'll teach you the other two reasons, but that's one principle I wanted to give you right now on Mother's Day. Okay? All right. So that's the teaching for today. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen because I'd love to pray for you. You know, I definitely love to pray for the saints and Anything you want to lift up before God, put it on the screen right now. Otherwise, I'm going to begin to speak in tongues and go in prayer and ask the Holy Ghost uh, what needs to be cast out, if he has any more prophetic words, if there's any physical healing. Okay, anything you want to put on the screen, any prayer requests? All right. All right, Holy Ghost is saying somebody's got some stomach problems. Put your left hand on your stomach and say, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by his stripes I'm healed. I command my digestion, my blood flow, my enzymes, my acid alkaline balance to be 100% whole in my stomach right now. I demand it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm seeing some pain in the temple. 
So if you got some pain right now in your temple, put your hand right on your temple. Say, right now in Jesus' name, I speak peace to my temple. And I command my temple to be 100% whole. Let it be 100% whole right now. Let the blood flow be there. Let the pain go away. And let it be restored to everything it should be in the name of Jesus. Because by his stripes I'm healed. Amen. Amen. All right, I believe that's all for the day. Time for you to go out and enjoy your Mother's Day meal if you haven't already. Spend time with your mom, with your mom or your grandma or your daughters or your sons if you're still alive, if you're a mother yourself. Enjoy your day. Remember that God has standards and parameters he wants us to live up to. If you want to be a godly woman, a godly mother, a godly grandmother, and there's great blessing in obeying God. So, so I challenge you and exhort you and encourage you today to study Titus 3, 4, and 5, and ask God to let your life look like that. Please enjoy the rest of your Mother's Day. Please enjoy your mom if you have her. Tell her that you love her. Uh, find something good to say. Give her some flowers. Give her a kiss. Give her a meal. Maybe let her sit down. Maybe rub her feet. Maybe clean the house. Find some way to bless your mother today and thank her for what she's done for you. All right? Amen, and God bless you. Don't forget to check out my No More Genies. Uh, teaching from last Thursday. I talked about thieves, and I will be here same time uh, next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. All right? God bless you. Happy Mother's Day, and I'll see you next time.